Hello and welcome to the uh, Aerospike Summit 2020. Uh, my name is Zohar. Uh, today we're going to talk in the next uh, 40 minutes about all flash. We're going to talk about sizing, deployment, management, and all of those things. Before we begin, uh, let me start by introducing myself. So my name is Zohar El Kayam. I'm a solution architect and a consultant at Aerospike. I have a background of around 22 years in database experience, mostly in the Aerospike, in the Oracle area. But I've been working for Aerospike for the last two years. And before that, I worked two years as a partner. And I work from the Tel Aviv office. So today we're going to talk about all flash. Uh, we're going to talk about the architecture that led and when to use uh, all flash. And uh, we're going to talk about planning all flash, which is a little bit complicated, and we'll try to unravel that. We're going to talk about the deployment, and then at the end we'll touch a couple of pitfalls where people are stumbling upon, and how to scale a all flash cluster. So before we begin everything, we need to remember the architecture that Aerospike works in. So the hybrid memory architecture means that the primary index is in memory and the data is on the device. On the other hand, the data itself is being divided into smaller partitions, uh, 4,096 partitions, and being spread across the cluster as a whole. Each of the partition actually has its own small primary index, and that index is even divided into smaller parts called sprigs. When we are trying to uh, calculate how much each of the records cost us in terms of memory, that will be 64 bytes of memory, and then whatever it needs to have on disk. When, whenever we want to uh, read or write a device or access a record, then the client would know what partition the record belongs to. It will know which node the node uh, has that partition, and then access that in a big O of one complexity, which is fairly very fast. In terms of how much does it cost us, if we'll take a scenario like 10 billion objects with 1.5 kilobytes per object, with including overhead and everything, and then a replication factor of two, then memory-wise, we would need 1.2 terabytes to hold that primary index. And we'll need around 28 terabytes in order to hold that data. If we'll think about how much does it actually cost us, that will be nine nodes, I3, N6, large AWS instances, uh, which would cost us around $150,000 a year. And that's a good ratio for having memory and data, but what would have happened if we had smaller objects, like 120 bytes objects? Then in that case, we'll have 10 billion objects, 128 bytes per object, we'll still need the 1.2 terabytes to hold the primary index, but we will only need 2.4 terabytes to hold the data. So we have 10% of the data, but we now need half of the cluster size in order to hold that, the R5D8 extra large. So that might be a problem. So what happened about a year ago that Aerospike introduced in version 4.3, the all flash storage option. The idea behind that is to keep not only the uh, data on disk, uh, we would also keep the primary index on disk, which means for edge system, for example, that they would be much more condensed. That means that if we have a relaxed latency needs, then we can do every read from the device. We don't need the actual memory. We, we do need some memory, but that would be a factor of about 1% of that. If we talk about system of records, we can build a huge system of records with billions and trillions of records without the need for huge indexes or in-memory indexes. In terms of how the cluster would actually look like from the client perspective, there's no change there. The client itself would still go to the correct node. It will still go and find the record in some kind of index. That index will be on disk. And then the data would still be pointed from the, in the, from the index into a device. And that won't change at all. From the client perspective or from the application perspective, nothing had changed. Maybe some performance uh, would be impacted because of the multiple reads or writes that we do from devices. 
So how much does it really save us? So let's take another scenario. Let's, talk, let's take 50 billion records and 128 bytes per object. For that, we would need around 6 terabytes of DRAM for the primary index. And then we would need around 12 terabytes for the actual data. And if we try to calculate that and figure what kind of instance, AWS instance, we would need for that, that would be the R5D16 extra large, costing us about $382,000 every year. If we do the same configuration on all flash, then we would need only 60 gigabytes of DRAM. We would need 16 terabytes for index, and I'll explain the calculation in a minute. And from that 16 terabytes, only 6 terabytes will actually be utilized. We would still need the 12 terabytes for data, but now we can keep that on five nodes of i3 and 6 extra, costing us $80,000. That's a $300,000 save. So how does it work? So I, I mentioned before that the primary index is a search, balanced binary search tree, the red-black tree, uh, which is being kept somewhere, and that doesn't change much. And then those, uh, that index is being split into sprigs, and sprigs are super important for all flash, and we'll explain why in a second. But if we look on the uh, entirety of the index, then the index itself isn't built as a huge chunk. It is smaller parts that we need to actually manage and work with. In memory, that would be easy. That's an in-memory structure, data structure that we can access very easily. When we talk about what happens on all flash, that's a different case. In terms of how we get to the records, that didn't change. The 60 gigabyte that we found earlier would still need to find the correct sprig to read from, and that sprig, that data structure is still available or still exists on the old flash, and that would be uh, the entirety of the memory that we would need for all flash configuration. So sprigs. Uh, the sprigs is, is the actual number of sub-indexes that we have for each of the partition. Uh, that is something that is correct both for in-memory uh, indexes and all flash. The idea is to lock smaller parts of the, in of the memory when we need to change it. So our default is 256, but it can go up to uh, go high ha up going to go up high as 256 million sprigs per partition. The thing is that once those sprigs are configured and once we build our primary index, in order to change that, then we would need to do a cold start. We would need to rebuild the entire primary index because we would now need to redefine the way that we divided the information inside our index. The other thing that we need to know about sprigs is that when we allocate sprigs in memory, then it would only take the exact amount of space that it actually needs. So if we, want, if we have one object and that allocates one sprig, then the entire memory allocation that we would have is 64 bytes. And if we have 10 objects, that would be 640 bytes. And it doesn't really matter how many springs are allocated. Once we do something with those, um, easy, it's easy to traverse with, uh, on the, prim on the uh, string itself. When we're talking about primary index on device, on all flash, then sprigs are being kept on disks. And disks can uh, actually allocate 64 bytes raw. They need to, uh, to uh, allocate a block, a disk block which is at minimum 4K bytes long. Once we do that, that means that if we allocate one record and that record allocates one sprig, we will automatically allocate 4K on the device. When the second object would come in and it will allocate another block, then it will cost us on device 8K bytes. If we have multiple, if we fell, uh, quote unquote, into the same sprig, then we won't need to allocate another one, but it will still cost us a 4K for that sprig. So that means that 
uh, it's really, really important for us uh, in terms of oil flash to get everything into a single sprig uh, on the device. And that means that a sprig cannot be bigger than 64 objects because 64 times 64 is the 4K bytes that they allocated for blocks. Okay, so how do we plan for all flash now that we know all of those important things? Um, planning for all flash isn't really different from planning for, uh, for hybrid memory or any other architecture. We would still need to know the basic things that we always ask people. What is the projected, projected the number of objects? How many objects do you want to keep in the database? What is the size of your data? How much data are you going to store? Usually we ask the average size of an object so we can multiply it uh, two. And then we'll ask what is your peak performance? How much reads and writes are you going to do at peak uh, each second? Once we have all that, uh, we usually can calculate in all flash how many sprigs we'll actually need in order to store that amount of data. We'll know how to take the uh, data and index and know how much space we would need for the both of them. And once we do that, we can understand how to allocate a minimal size of the cluster in order to support that configuration. Okay, so calculating the number of sprigs. If we talk about uh, having 64 objects in a sprig, then that might be a little bit dangerous for us because we can exceed that and then we would need to have um, multiple sprig, multiple blocks for the same sprig and that will hinder the performance greatly because we'll need to do multiple I operations on the device in order to actually read the record. We, only know, we also know that the number of sprigs must be a power of two. So what we do when we try to calculate the number of sprigs or estimate the number of sprigs that we need is define an imaginary fill fraction, which means how many, uh, how many uh, objects we're going to put in a single sprig in average. And uh, that will be a percentile. So we will say we want to keep about 50% of the uh, sprig empty. So we'll try to keep 32 objects per sprig and not 64 like we did before. And once we do that, we can have a calculation which is finding the closest uh, power of two of that uh, number and, and actually find what is the uh, ideal number of sprigs that we can, find, uh, we can have. So if we're talking about 10 billion records, for example, with field fraction of 50%, then we would need 128,000 sprigs per partition. And if we had 50 billion, then we'll have uh, five, uh, half a million uh, sprigs per partition and so on. But we need to remember that we actually rounded up a couple of times during the calculation. So uh, working, aiming for 10 billion records is actually aiming for 14 billion records, which, which can actually grow to 31 billion records, meaning our cluster can be, we can define it uh, easily and then understand what is the actual capacity. If you remember, exceeding those the number, the higher number, would mean that we would need to break the uh, sprigs into multiple blocks, or on the other hand, uh, try to re, uh, rebuild the sprigs and uh, recalculate them. So 50 billion is actually aiming for 55 billion, and 100 billion is actually aiming for 110 billion, but the number are astronomical. So usually getting the uh, target number right uh, pretty much solves us the problem. Once we have the spring formula, then we can calculate what will be the size of the index that will actually be allocated on the device. We can, we can multiply the number of sprigs by the number of partition, by the uh, actual um, block size that we have, and we can understand how many records, uh, sorry, how big is the index that we'll actually need to allocate on the device. But if you remember, we said earlier that that doesn't mean that, like, if we do that, then the cluster, uh, the index will grow very rapidly because every new sprig that we allocate will actually uh, take us some space on the device. So we, ha we call that uh, period of saturation um, uh, the ramp up of the database. 
So once record starts flowing into the database, the index will be fully allocated. And once it's fully allocated on the device, it will never grow behind, beyond that point. And it's really important to understand that because once that would happen, uh, we usually end up with devices that are full, uh, almost full, and we need to um, get ready for that be strange behavior. On the, on the second part of the equation, it, after we calculated the index and how much the index would actually need, we need to calculate how much the data will need. And, and that really is the same formula that we use for the, the hybrid solution. It's the number of objects times the size average uh, object size, the object average size, and then the replication factor. And then we need to keep some space for defragmentation. That's the high watermark disk. And that's not different from the things that we did before. Once we have those two uh, numbers and those two figures, then that will be the time that we will try to understand how many nodes we would need in our cluster. So if we know that each partition has a price and that price is like a fixed price, um, then we would be able to calculate what will be the need for the disk itself because we evenly distribute our partition across nodes. So we know that if we have a cluster of 10 nodes, then each, part, each cluster would have the exact same number of partitions, that's around 120. And if we have a cluster of 20 nodes, that would be half of that. That would be 40, 400 and something uh, nodes. Sorry, 400 and something partitions. So we can calculate the ratio between the index and disk, and by doing that, we can figure out what would be the minimum cluster size once we know what the allocated disk we're going to have for each of the uh, each of the parts, uh, index and data. So when doing that on bare metal systems, that's pretty easy. Once we get to that number, we can go buy our own devices. We can buy uh, fast devices for our index, NVMEs usually, and then uh, that will be allocated for the index. And then we can buy not very fast devices or uh, as low SSDs in order to keep the data, and that's fine. But when we talk about cloud environments and cloud solution like AWS, GCP, and others, then we don't get to choose what devices we're going to get and how to divide the data between the index and the data itself. So we need to take that devices that they provide, like the, the cloud provider uh, provided us and then find a way to split those between index and data and try to make that coherence because at the end of the day, we actually need to use that. Uh, in terms of memory utilization, that's usually not an issue. We would might want to allocate uh, from the operating size a min kilobytes, uh, but that usually isn't a problem. Uh, we would also sometimes would like to enable the uh, Linux page cache in order, in order to cache uh, frequently read objects and then save us some re reads from the disk, uh, from the data disk. But that does nothing for the index, so uh, keep that in mind. Performance consideration when planning uh, is crucial here. Uh, we usually don't plan for a very low latency um, system when talking about all flash. We would usually understand and know that we have relaxed needs from reading and writing operations. Because if when we talked about hybrid memory, then everything was reading and writing a single object uh, on the device. Uh, when we're talking about all flash, then we would need to read and write multiple times. Uh, when we uh, look at the uh, block size itself at the end of the day, then that al might also be a consideration because when we do a smaller block size, defragmentation might happen too, might happen too often. And if the block size is fairly big, then whenever we defrag, then we need to update and change a lot of records. Then, so we need to actually uh, be aware of uh, the per, um, we should probably should be aware of performance consideration uh, when we do that, and we'll talk about how to fix and scale things out uh, in a minute. 
Okay, so that was very, very complicated, and, and it is something that uh, might be mind-boggling for some people. So the one thing that we did do in order to help our customers and users uh, work with AllFlash and plan for AllFlash, uh, we built a solution architect team, built a tool, a, a calculator. It's an internal tool that we will be happy to show you and uh, use it with you. Uh, to actually try and figure out what would be the best allocation for all flesh. We would get into that calculator the number of objects and the uh, high water marks and some uh, other configuration parameters that we would need. And then that will yield us the information about how many data um, how many data there is and how many uh, how much data is going to be generated for index and data and after that we'll be actually able to say what type of nodes or what type of instances we're going to use how much data a disk we have there and then calculate the actual size of the cluster including parameters like the stage size and the mean cluster size, which are both things that need to be calculated. Uh, I will answer all questions at the end of the session, if that's okay. Okay, so configuration, uh, going to the deployment side and to the next stage, um, configuring the namespace is fairly easy. It's uh, a matter of just setting the uh, index type to flash and then we need to create a mount point for the primary index. Uh, this pri uh, mount point should be initialized in a file system, which we usually don't do for our data. It should be mounted before our spike starts. Uh, we need to remember that file systems do have their own overhead, so uh, be careful about that when you uh, size your uh, systems and understand that ext4 and xfs both have overhead uh, that is unrelated to aerospike by but in terms of how many uh, i nodes are uh, allocating and, and other things uh, once we do that uh, from there it's really just a matter of setting the devices where to store the data and setting parameters like the part the partition tree sprigs that we talked about earlier and in case we go over 2 terabytes per index per node, then we'll need to adjust the arena size by setting the index stage size. And one uh, interesting thing about the index stage size is that we allocate those in chunks, meaning uh, we don't allocate uh, individual blocks. When we need to uh, allocate uh, an actual block, we'll actually allocate the entire arena. Um, so. Uh, there won't be like a million files in a directory, though there will be an actually uh, one or two or four uh, gigabytes uh, sized object uh, multiplied by the uh, storage that we we'll need to do in order to keep the entire index on device. And the configuration file at the end would look something like that. We'll have the index type flash uh, with the mount points. We'll need to configure the mount size limit and the mount high watermark. It's like the uh, memory high watermark that uh, has the, uh, that we have in, in memory uh, architectures. Uh, we'll need to define the partition tree sprigs, which I remind you is not, uh, you can change it. You'll need to do a cold start if you change it. And then you need to set the index stage size, again, not the dynamic parameters. Uh, we try to get it right on the first uh, run. Okay, so some pitfalls and where people are uh, getting uh, stumbled upon them and things that they need to uh, to actually uh, be aware of and understand. The first thing is the minimum cluster size. So since the index is rapidly allocated, uh, very quickly after we ramp up the database, uh, there will, we would have on device uh, a huge index. It can be as big as a few terabytes uh, but once it's allocated, uh, it is allocated, and it, it is never deallocated, even if things move around and partition migrate and things like that. So in order to do that, we need to think about what would be the minimum size of the cluster that we would have uh, in order to work with that. So we would need to think what would happen if the cluster would go below a certain number of nodes, uh, 
and where we would store the entirety of the index on the device. If we don't store that, if we don't know what will be the minimum cluster size, then we might fall into a, a situation where things go out of memory, so quote unquote, and they actually go out of disk space. So in that case, we would try to set the minimum cluster size to a number that will actually be able to store. And then later, uh, we know that if we go below that number, the cluster will, as a whole would stop working in order to protect itself. So that's one thing uh, to do. The calculator helps us with uh, figuring out that minimum cluster size. Um, Another thing that sometimes happens, and we usually try to uh, work around that, is planning for the wrong number of objects. Uh, it happened in the past that customers try to, to uh, plan for, let's say, one or two billion objects where they had 50 or 100. When we talk about in-memory architecture, it's easy for us to scale, to scale the number of objects. We add more uh, We add more. Uh, hardware, for example, add more nodes. And then that usually solves the problems because now we can allocate more DRAM for that. When we talk about uh, all flash, the number of sprigs is pre-allocated. So once we go over the number of objects, we will need to modify the partition sprig, uh, sprigs, uh, par uh, partition tree sprigs, uh, and that could be a big hassle. It's not something that we can do. Uh, it is something that we can do in a rolling upgrade fashion, and it is something that uh, uh, we can do on the fly uh, for the most part, except the restarting part. But once we do that, we usually double the amount of uh, space that we'll need for the index, so that will require adding some more resources to accommodate the increased size of the index. Other pitfalls that people usually uh, fall into is planning for the wrong object size. Um, people think that their object size is 128 bytes, but it's actually actually 600 bytes or even bigger than that, it's 1K or something like that. So now they have all the index allocated, but they don't have enough disk space for that. So there's an easy solution for that. Uh, we can add more nodes because data uh, would scale in that term. We can add more instances to the cluster. Migration would uh, rebound the partitions, and we will gain the additional uh, disk space. Uh, the same goes for perf performance. If we want to add more performance, more uh, dev uh, devices to the system, in order to give the a better performance, and because we have more reads or writes than we thought uh, we would uh, in the in first place that's an easy fix too. Uh, just add another node that would add more devices. We can scale the number of objects, but we can we can scale the other parts of the uh, databases. So adding nodes is fairly easy. Uh, just like in a regular uh, hybrid memory architecture, we add the node. Uh, the node needs to be the same as the other nodes uh, in terms of how much space we allocate for index and data, um, basically, uh, the, we need to think about what will happen if we uh, drop a node. Uh, we usually try to uh, take that into consideration uh, beforehand. Uh, most of the things that I said in this uh, session and in this talk um, are on our website. Uh, so uh, this presentation will be available in about an hour, so you can download it. Most of the interesting stuff is already linked from the PDF that you will be able to download. Uh, the uh, disk planning section of this, uh, of this uh, uh, session was taken from the planning capacity for index that the first link uh, configuration of the index and sprigs inf uh, information and explanation is from the second link. And we have a white paper or knowledge base article about the uh, FAQ for all flash. Um, and you can use that and read from that. And uh, this is our time for Q&A. So uh, let me pull up the questions that I got during the session. And uh, let's start with the first one. The first question 
was uh, other than the I3EN, what AWS EC2 instance types are most commonly selected. So the I3EN and the I3s on the AWS are usually uh, instance types that has a huge dat- uh, disks. Um, those are the ones with the largest disks that we actually uh, have on AWS. One has 1.9 gigabytes and the other one has 7.5 gigabytes and then a multiplication of those numbers. So usually when people would go with uh, all flash, they would go with one of those instance types. But again, it's something that we can easily uh, calculate together when we do, if, if you approach us and ask us about that. Uh, the second question is, is Aerospy calculator for all flash accessible to us? The calculator itself is not online. It's an internal tool that we use. We usually use it as a guidance uh, more than an actual uh, give, like give us the correct uh, number or the, the final number. Uh, we use it to get an estimation and an understanding of what's going on. Uh, but it's easy enough for talking to a solution architect and and approaching solution architect, and they will be happy to help you do the capacity planning and figure out if these are actually things that are interesting to you or uh, what will be the actual size of the cluster. And that's the same for the where we can find the calculator. the another question is uh, mount high water percent 90% txt4 and xfs tend to lose performance before reaching 95% usage do you think that's too high so the number that we put on the um, on the deck is is just an example of uh, what will actually happen the 90% for mount high water mark isn't actually 90% 95% of the actual mount it's a percentile of how much of the um, configuration will be actually uh, allocated for index before doing ev- uh, evictions uh, on the data. In 4.9 and after, that number is usually set to zero, meaning uh, evictions and expirations are turned off by default. Um, so the 95% isn't from the actual disk space, it's from the allocated mount space that we, uh, max mount space that we allocate. Hold on. Tons of questions. Um, the next one, question is: uh, Let me see. Is page cache used for all flash indexes? Um, page, uh, read page cache can be utilized by all flash, uh, but that will be for the data itself and not for the index. For the index, that will be automatically turned on because the file system, operating system, is actually using that um, naturally. Uh, we don't need to turn anything on. If the use case is such that we read the same record uh, time and time again, um, so the records are uh, considered hot, then turning on the page cache might be useful. In other cases, uh, it doesn't really matter. If you just write the records and the records are therefore cold store, there's no point in turning the cache, the page cache, the read page cache uh, on. Uh, but if it's something that you actually read again and again, then yes, the turning the page cache in all flash uh, does save us some uh, disk reads. Uh, next, next question. Is there an AWS instance sizing and performance calculator available? There is no actually, there's no actual uh, instance, uh, there's no calculator available online. Uh, we are planning to add one uh, in the future. Uh, we usually do that with our customers. We have an internal tool uh, that is really complicated, and that's why we don't put it online yet. Um, but again, if you reach out to uh, SA, we usually uh, tend to be very helpful with those. Uh, is there an AWS cost calculator for Aerospike? And the same question. That's the same calculator. We use uh, we use the same calculator in order to do the calculation. Uh, we put in so many the different parameters in there, uh, not only price. Uh, we use the disk performance, the memory that those have, uh, the uh, network utilization that you can reach on those um, on those instance types, and so on and so forth. Uh, how is the Aerospike performance different from cloud versus on-prem bare metal instances? Okay, so um, in terms of 
performance, uh, at the end of the day, it's just physics. If the discs are fast enough and uh, we can uh, depend on the disc, that's where the performance gain comes from. When people usually build their own on-prem bare metal uh, systems, they can choose the type of disc that they're going to use. Uh, and that means that the performance that they're going to get there is very much predictable. When we're talking about cloud environments, then we can't really choose the div disks that we have. Uh, it's true for all flash, but it's true for other uh, types of databases as well, like, um, hybrid memory and so on. Uh, we can measure that, and we do. We have a tool called ACT to test the performance, but usually the performance that we would get from bare metal disks and, and the ones that we buy are much better than the ones that we found in cloud environments. So usually bare metal uh, tends to be uh, to to be smaller and, and more performant. Next question: Can AeroSpike on Kubernetes be used for production grade performance? The answer is yes, yes, and we have customers who do who do that. Um, you can reach out to the Ask AeroSpike um, for um, for getting some more information about that. Uh, it's all basically uh, written in our Aerospike uh, Cloud Foundation uh, documentation. That was the last of our questions. I thank you very much for your time. Uh, you are, you know, this is my email, you are most welcome to send me questions if you have some after the session. Uh, I would be the Ask Aerospike uh, chat room um, from now and I guess for the next two hours. Uh, thank you again, and have a great day.